and the recording has been started. Uh, my name is Michelle Piper. I work in the Online Learning and Services Department. And today we have uh, Kim Wolf, who's the, uh, and Kim, I'll let you give your title. I'm the Program Director for the Clearwater Campus Library. And Suzanne Gartner. Hi, I'm Suzanne, and I am the General Counsel for the College. And today they're going to be doing a presentation that they did back at our teaching and learning event in April of this year. And this was a really well-received event. Uh, we had a lot of questions um, after the event. A lot of people who weren't able to make it definitely wanted to see it again. So we wanted to take this opportunity during the summer to uh, make this presentation available and to record it for those who maybe, maybe they don't teach this summer, so aren't able to attend. So again, we will be recording, and if you have any questions as the presentation gets going, make sure to type them into the text chat window, and we will be keeping track of that and answering questions throughout the presentation. So with that, I will hand it over to Kim and Suzanne, and if there's any issues, just let me know. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, this is Kim Wolf, and uh, we're happy to talk to you today about an issue that seems to be puzzling for a lot of people, and that's because largely it's not a black and white area, but there are some gray areas in it and some interpretation. One of the first things I want to show you is linked to our title right here, and this is a resource guide that we have available for you with a faculty tab that will not only give you a copy of this PowerPoint, but another PowerPoint, if you notice at the bottom left, that has even more content in it. In addition, you have college rules, you also have federal rules, and in the center, these are common questions that I have received from different faculty members. So this is a very useful guide for you. One of the ways to work well with copyright is to use materials that are already um, created in order to give you free access for use. And the Creative Commons tabs gives you several search engines and several websites that you can use in order to locate that um, piece of material that you don't have to worry so much about copyright issues with. We go back to the PowerPoint. Uh, we'll go on through, and as I said, this is a conundrum for a lot of people. Uh, some operate under the assumption that because we're using it for education, we can use it, and that's not also always the case. Always, uh, we often have to consider who the boss is. Is it what the college says? Is it what the law says? Is it the guidelines that we sometimes read? So it's, it's something that people begin to develop angst over. So with Suzanne Gardner here and the expert from a legal perspective, <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to her to give you some of the uh, uh, parameters that you need to keep in mind as you decide on content that you want to load into your courses and use for other reasons. Okay, first uh, I think we're going to go ahead and look at copyright, copyright law, and just kind of get um, some basics down as to what it provides for and why we have it in place. Um, and then as we go through this, uh, there will be some opportunity. We'll be stopping for questions, so as we go through it, if you wanted to post any questions you have, um, when we get to a certain point, uh, we'll go ahead and we will attempt to answer questions. Um, I'm not really an expert, but um, I uh, will tell you what I know about copyright, um, and uh, we can um, certainly get you the answers to any questions that you pose today, um, uh, either during this webinar or if we uh, need to provide extra materials later. Um, what is copyright? Uh, basically, from a public policy standpoint, um, copyright really uh, serves several purposes and particularly for us in, in education, um, there is certainly the uh, provision of providing um, rights and protection for those that um, have created uh, works. Um, and under copyright, that would be for a period of time um, and also for uh, a certain uh, created work. Um, but there's also that public policy of wanting to promote creativity and learning um, such that um, it would really be um, encouraging uh, those to create such works and to have them out um, publicly. Um, so the provision of, of uh, copyright law and, 
and copyright protection is there to, um, to, to really further those uh, purposes. Um, so basically, copyright is the right of the author or the creator to control the use of their work. Um, as we said, it's for a limited period of time, um, and uh, it's also for particular uh, work that's um, identified. Um, the copyrighted work must be um, an original work, um, which is in a fixed uh, tangible medium of expression. So we could talk a little bit more about what that means, but basically um, if your created work um, has been tangibly um, expressed in, in print or recorded or um, otherwise um, in a fixed medium, uh, it will be protected under copyright law. Um, copyright law is federal um, and the provision there is listed. Um, what's covered, basically, um, as we said, is anything that's uh, fixed in tangible medium. Um, you don't have to register uh, with the Copyright Office to have protection. Um, as long as it's uh, a, a fixed medium, the protection is there. Um, it includes literary works, scholarly works, musical works, sound recordings, dramatic works, uh, performance, art, motion picture, and also images and photographs. So as we look to um, what would be the rights of somebody that has uh, copyright, um, these are the, the basics. Um, the copyright holder or the creator has the right to reproduce the work. They have the right to copy it or to, to copy it into different formats. Um, they also have the right to distribute the work. Um, they also have the right to create derivative works, um, and so that right would extend down to uh, things that uh, would be supplicant, sub subsequent work um, of the same author. Um, there's also the right to perform the work publicly and also to display the work publicly, um, and also to perform any sound recordings. Um, and that would be where there would be a transmission of, um, of the recording in a digital format, such as a um, transmission of a, a, of a live performance in some, or in some fashion. Okay, what is not included um, in copyright? There are several things by statute that are not included um, as things that are, are copyrightable. And those would include um, ideas, methods, systems, slogans, things that are trademarked or things that would be patented, such as um, ideas and creations, innovations. Um, also, uh, there are things in uh, the public domain that are not copyrightable. So copyright would not apply to news stories. And that would include uh, newspaper articles. It would include editorials, commentaries, um, ed op pieces, or, or anything that uh, you could find through public media. Um, it would also include things that are in the public domain because they're published by the government. So anything that you could find um, that is issued or published um, from the government would be in the uh, public domain and would not uh, be copyrighted. So it's there for your for your free use. Um, also, any works that uh, were created before 1923 would be in the public domain. Um, also, things that are considered fair use for us um, would be considered um, something that would not necessarily be um, covered by copyright. Um, or it may be copyrighted, but um, we have the ability to use it um, under the fair use doctrines. So at this point, are there any questions? We're going to talk quite a bit more about fair use, but so far, um, are there any questions? I don't see any questions. I see Patriva is typing, so we'll wait for just a minute. Um, one of the things when we talk about copyright is copyright is different than giving attribution. So we always encourage you to give attribution when you have used something, whether it's a copyright-free item 
or whether it is something else. Is okay. there, Patricia asks, is there a rule of thumb on time frame? Okay, are you saying if something's copyrighted, um, is there a rule of thumb as to how long it remains copyrighted? Um, okay, yes, um, that's a good question. If something um, is copyrighted, it remains protected through that person's lifetime. Okay. I don't know if that uh, if if that answers the question, or if there's uh, any follow-up questions to that, please let me know. There is also on the LibGuide on the top right, there is a digital slider that enables you to type in what you know about the work in terms of the date on it, and it takes you through the steps of telling you whether it is copyrighted or not. Because over time, that time frame that you speak of has changed uh, several times. So if something was published in the 1920s, it might be under a different time frame than something that was published in the 1970s. So it's always good to go in there and look at that digital slider and it will help you uh, very quickly determine whether what you have is in the public domain. Okay. Another thing to remember is that um, there are um, things that are copyrighted through the U.S. Copyright Office um, but it would not necessarily be the case that you would have to register copyright in order for the protections to be there. So things are inherently uh, protected if they are in a fixed medium. Um, and so there are added protections if you went ahead and you would file them with the Copyright Office. Um, so um, as Kim said, uh, there are ways to go ahead and check as to what the copyright is or they, there may be um, some ability to ascertain whether it may be out there in public domain or may have been published um, before 1923 or, you know, or, or other inquiries. Okay. All right. All right. So we'll move on and talk a little bit more um, about uh, copyright and what, uh, what options do we have if we're going to be working with things um, that are copyrighted. Um, so basically we're going to discuss um, fair use. We're going to be looking at licenses. We're also going to be lo looking at um, or at least discussing um, briefly um, consent, uh, consent and permission to use uh, different documents and um, what might be some, um, some alternatives um, and how that might relate to, uh, to, to fair use doctrine. So basically when we're talking about um, licenses, we're talking about an agreement. And so uh, through these types of contracts or agreements, uh, we have the ability uh, to gain um, the use of material under a license or basically it's a permission to go ahead and use certain uh, documents uh, for certain purposes. And we're looking at a license um, we would be using license that would identify um, use of a certain portion or a, a, a certain work, but it would also um, be for a certain time, uh, generally, and it would be for a certain purpose. Um, so as long as we operate under the parameters of the license, um, we would have permission uh, to use that, and that would uh, would um, be in place for us. Um, the licenses do trump fair use, so um, the license is there um, contractually, um, and so it gives us 100% uh, permission as long as we're within the parameters of a license. Um, but we also would have um, the ability to look at fair use if there may be materials um, that may not um, be accessible through a license. So to give you a, an example of some kinds of licensing, the databases that the library provides have licensed content in them and they allow you to use them within the educational system. Sometimes you will see a movie shown on campus. That movie has been licensed. It may not appear that way to you because it doesn't say ding 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 this has been licensed, but we typically work through several companies 
we obtain the license for a certain size audience to be shown on a certain date and we have permission to do that. So sometimes you may inquire about, oh, I, I showed this movie, can I show it again to another class? Well, if you didn't indicate that in the initial license, you may not be able to. If you find great content that you want to use that's a, a film, a video, or something like that, and it is not already licensed by the college or in one of our databases, then contact your campus librarian. And what we will do is we will get a licensing price, and we will need to know the size of your class and for what period of time you want it whether you want to use it in your online class or whether you want to just show it in a face-to-face -face because the requirements are different for both. Any questions on license? Or we can certainly circle back around on that. Um, I think uh, we will uh, start our discussion with fair use. I don't know, uh, maybe we could go through the four different elements of it and then maybe look at the checklist. Yes. Um, so I think we'll start uh, to talk about what is fair use, and fair use is, is really uh, the mechanism that we're able to use to be able to uh, access and um, uh, legally use uh, many materials in the educational setting um, for the purposes that, uh, that, that we would have. Um, basically, is an exception to the copyright law. And it does allow us to use copyright materials without obtaining permission where we can't get it or it's hard to get for some reason, um, as long as that uh, permission is deemed to be fair. And um, basically, as we're looking at this, um, it is not an exact science. Um, there's no real definitive standards other than it's a balancing test that takes into consideration these four different uh, factors as you're looking at um, a particular work and how you're going to use it. And so we'll go through the different uh, four factors and how, they're, how they uh, would weigh them on both sides. And then we can look at the checklist, which uh, should certainly help you as you're going through material and you want to figure out whether um, there would be um, fair use uh, presumed um, or not in a certain case. Um, so first we'll look at the purpose um, and the character of the use. Um, as we're looking at uh, the purpose, um, basically fair use would favor nonprofit educational use over profit and commercial use. Um, and uh, also it looks at the character of the work um, in terms of the, the audience, uh, what type of work is it? Um, is it something out there that's more commercial or is it something that's out there that um, is intended to be um, for, the, uh, for education and research or out there for the educational arena? Um, a second part of that is the uh, transformative use of it in certain cases. And as we're looking at transformative use, um, we're looking at um, whether the, uh, the use of it um, has been transformed in such a way um, that you're not really copying um, the original work, but that you are uh, using some um, form of it, um, but um, it's been transformed into um, a, a work that uh, may be tailored for what your purpose is in the classroom. Um, so it um, may be um, uh, something where you're looking at um, a work that um, may be a parody or a satire or a piece of art. That's where we normally see the transformative use, um, where the, uh, the meaning from the original work is part of what's being communicated through the, the transformed work, um, but the, the purpose um, and character of it um, would uh, be more transformative, so it would be uh, more uh, lending itself towards fair use um, and, and, and not, uh, not other. I see there is a question. An example of transformative use. Um, the courts ruled that Two Live Crew's use of the uh, theme song from Pretty, Women, Pretty Woman 
was transformative. They used the same words, they used the beginning of it, but it was judged that putting it into the wrap format was so transformative that it was a totally different um, song from both audience and cultural appeal that it was deemed a fair use of the item. So they took a song done by somebody else in another time period and transformed it using some of the words, I believe the first line and the melody with the first line, all of the words for the rest of the song, but they put it to different music. And that was deemed fair use. That was quite transformative. Okay, um, that's a very good example. Um, I think we may see this uh, uh, type of work um, maybe more in music and art, um, in commentary, parody, or satire, where there may be um, an original piece um, that may have kind of a, almost an iconic meaning, but then when you're using it and you're transforming it into something else, um, you're kind of taking the meaning from the first one, adding something else, and that's where you're, you know, you're actually creating a, another work from it, but you're taking the meaning and the, um, I guess, the character of the first work. Um, so anyway, um, I think the example that, that Kim gave actually is a very good one. Um, so that's uh, what's meant um, at, um, when we look at transformative views. You know, another example that you might be using in your classroom is if you do show a movie in your classroom, you can't show it for entertainment or as a reward uh, for something your students did. But if you're analyzing the technique used to create it, if you're, anal if you're a, a physics teacher and you're analyzing the physics in one of these special effects things, if you're a psychology teacher and you're showing it and you're asking your students to pick out every instance where there's evidence of a mental health concern and then you bring that into the concept of a fuller lesson, that's considered more transformative and would lean in favor of fair use. Does that help? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, these are good examples. I think obviously okay. the more trans uh, transformative or the more transformed the use is, um, the more it would uh, weigh in favor of a fair use because um, you are tailoring that use for your for your classroom um, or for your project. Um, as for the uh, the nature of the work, um, we're basically looking at um, the nature is it more, uh, artistic or creative versus more uh, factual? Um, is it published or um, is it um, unpublished? And so when we're looking at the nature of the work, um, we would uh, be looking um, to whether there would be a fair use concerning um, the creativ creativity. Uh, we'd be looking at um, whether it was published or unpublished. There would be um, a, uh, a, a, a favoring of the published work, um, and uh, there would also be a favoring of kind of the factual um, and less creative work. Um, so we are looking at the nature of it um, as the second prong of, of that example and uh, in, the, in the four uh, factor test. Um, as we're looking for the, um, the third factor, the amount of time, um, the general, um, I, I guess, rule here would be smaller is better. Um, when we start looking at using more than 50% of something, um, you know, we start looking at whether we are um, capturing um, the whole work. Um, because we don't want to use what's considered the heart of the work or the essential portion of the work um, with, without considering um, the, the copyright. Um, so smaller is better in general, but we certainly don't want to, um, to just take a small amount that may be the actual heart of the work and 
an example of that might be if there's a newly published book um, and the heart of the work may just be um, one part of it um, where um, it really kind of represents the you know the the whole work itself or the research itself um, if we're just going to take that part of it even though it may page by page be a smaller amount if we're taking the heart of the work then we're moving further and further away from from fair use so it's a balancing uh, test here but um, uh, in general, we want to take only the portion that we need, and we don't want to necessarily um, just uh, take any portion of it that, that would be considered the essential message of the work. It's like blowing the punchline on a joke. <laughs> um, but referring to a book, there was a case, the, the um, Gerald Ford's memoirs, and the section of that book that dealt with how he made his decision to pardon Nixon uh, was challenged uh, because Nation Magazine published some of it in advance of the book and the serialization rights that were given to Time Magazine. And it was judged to not be fair use because the portion that they took was the part that people really wanted to read and know about. Once they knew that, it definitely impacted the market value. So that was a good example of amount. Um, again, I think uh, you know that is a case by case kind of assessment, and would want to be viewed in the context of all four of these different uh, factors. Uh, the market effect. Um, basically, what you're looking at here is you're you're looking at the effect it has um, commercially, um, and the impact it would have on the author or the creator of the work. Um, so obviously if we're looking at something that is created, um, a textbook that is intended to be sold, um, if we were to take portions of it um, and use it then you know the potential is there to actually uh, impo impact the market um, because uh, you know th the intent or the purpose of it would be um, to be to be bought by students and, and uh, to be marketed commercially. So um, as we look at the four, um, you kind of look at them um, together um, and then kind of uh, check, use your checklist to uh, weigh the, the, you know, the uh, impact of each of these and then come to a determination as to whether it's fair use or not. This particular checklist was produced by Kenneth Cruz, who is somebody who's widely respected uh, for his work in the copyright field. And he created this and many institutions have taken it. It's Creative Commons. We could rebrand it for St. Pete College. But one of the things when you're considering or when you have a challenge um, of, of your use of material, it's always good to have a piece of paper like this that shows that you did give uh, concerted thought before you used or made your fair use decision. So if you keep a checklist like that and you take notes about how you arrived at determining that something was fair use for you to use in your class and then tuck this away, scan it in, stick it in a folder, <clears throat> and then you have this should there be a challenge to anything. It's very easy, again, as Suzanne said, it's a balancing act. It doesn't mean that if you check everything, you know, two or three here and three here that that you can't still weigh in, in favor of fair use, but you need to show what your thought pattern was. At a minimum, if, if somebody decides that you violated, it's not willful. It shows that you had a thought pattern and in, in, with all good intention, uh, you felt that this was fair use. Right. I think as you're looking through it, um, it is a balancing test. We do need to show good faith that we've gone through to um, to really consider that something is a is a, a fair use. I think if there are available copies um, or there is the ability to get permission or there's the ability to uh, to use a license or to be granted license to use it, and we would choose not to do that, um, then then obviously good faith is really not going to be found. 
So when you're looking at this and looking at the four factors, you're basically um, you're, you're looking at uh, materials that um, you're using a small quantity, um, you're using it for educational purposes, and you're not trying to circumvent um, anybody else's ability to um, to use it commercially. Um, so I, I think um, I, I think whoops. So I think um, that uh, that as you go through the four, um, uh, as long as you can show that uh, you've made a good faith effort, um, it can be it'll be considered fair use. Anyway, um, in terms of uh, the multimedia guidelines, um, I think it's important to remember that. Um, if you are including any kind of materials, um, they must be uh, legally uh, acquired. Um, the, there is the ability to um, take different portions under fair use and um, kind of put materials together for teaching and instructional purposes. Um, and so you can include those um, when you're working on your own uh, project um, or, or uh, materials that you're using in a teaching setting um, or for any kind of uh, curriculum-based instructional activities. Um, I think as you're working with students, I think it's good to remember that students likewise <clears throat> can be doing the same thing under fair use guidelines. And I think it's important to remember that it has to be um, something that the students can use um, in the classroom and uh, that it is for purposes of that course and uh, also the student um, could use that um, in some other settings as well um, in portfolios or <clears throat> even in applications to other institutions they could use it but it has to be um, in the context of their their education and would have to be um, in the context of using it in that course um, I think there is uh, a question about uh, YouTube videos. Um, I'll let Kim weigh in here too, but uh, YouTube uh, videos, um, we should not assume that just because something's on the internet and something's out there on YouTube that it may not be copyrighted. So I think we do need to make a concerted effort and do our due diligence and also try to figure out um, whether something's copyrighted just because it's on YouTube doesn't mean that it's public domain. Um, I think it does mean that uh, some things could be copyrighted um, and they're put out there. Some things could be put out there illegally. And it also means that some things may be put out um, by individuals that have intended that, you know, they are out there for public use um, and out there for use uh, with, with their consent. Um, but um, I think we should not assume that anything that's on YouTube is necessarily <clears throat> something that we, we shouldn't be looking for permission to use. I think you need to remember that when, you, when in doubt, you can link to almost anything. There are a few things that I've come across that in the terms of use uh, at the bottom of something, it will say that they don't permit linking. But really, when you are putting a link in something, you have not copied anything. And you're not distributing the content, you're distributing the link. I, I know that sounds like a fine line, but right now the law is going with that fine line. So if you are in doubt about a YouTube video, then you want to make sure that uh, you provide a link to it and your students can still go out to it and it shouldn't be a problem. Okay. Um, I think uh, we're just going to briefly touch on the, the TEACH Act um, because basic, this basically covers the, um, the part of the law that uh, was a response to um, just the um, increased use of um, digital materials and the increased use of online and online education. <clears throat> so basically what the uh, TEACH Act um, has endeavored to do has endeavored to do is to take the uh, permissions and exceptions that we have for face-to-face -face teaching and to put them out there 
um, for um, online instruction. So there are some provisions of the TEACH Act that um, are out there, but there also are a lot of conditions. Um, and so under the TEACH Act, we are um, able to use some digitized materials um, on our online classes or through uh, the provision of, of uh, online materials um, that uh, are covered um, under this act, but also um, where they may not be covered, um, we may also have uh, to the fallback of the fair use. I think if we open up the checklist, it will give us a good idea of what um, is required in order to use the TEACH Act. <clears throat> so here's the TEACH Act requirements. I think some of the things to remember about the TEACH Act is that um, for the provisions that are provided for face-to-face -face instruction and are extended out through the TEACH Act, um, we are able to use some digitized uh, works for distance education, um, but only to use them to the extent that they could have been used in the face-to-face -face classes. Um, in, uh, in other words, uh, for materials like movies that we might have been able to show face-to-face, if we're going to extend that out to the online environment, we have to uh, work under the rubric of the TEACH Act, um, which does provide some certain provisions for protection um, of copyright. And also, um, there are some restrictions that are directly related um, to um, technological protections that we would put in place. Um, so basically, um, there would have to be uh, the provision that we are a non-for-profit, that we are an educational institution. Uh, we have to have policies concerning the use of copyright materials. Um, we have to make sure that um, as we're looking at um, the technological um, considerations that there isn't the ability um, for uh, portions that may not be within fair use um, to be copied, downloaded, or disseminated, disseminated outside of what might be permitted. Um, so um, as we go through this checklist, um, what's really key um, is the use, also um, the technological provisions that we have um, for protection, um, and also the ability um, for, the, uh, for the students or for anyone else to access and download. Um, so it has to be in the setting where um, the teacher um, is uh, mediating the instruction, um, where it's only for the students in the course, where it's on a secured network, where um, the only portion that can be utilized is the portion that um, would be allowed um, and that no uh, restricted portion could be downloaded or disseminated outside of the course. Um, we want to make sure that uh, we could um, download it during the time of the course or have it available for students, um, but then um, there would not be any unauthorized use or use that could be um, uh, made after the class or access that would be av available after the class. Um, it should only be available for the portion of the time that the student would need to have um, access to those materials, and it would have to be securely uh, stored um, and in a, in a format where it could not be um, further disseminated or downloaded. Um, and so we do have to be careful that we only use the amount that we need, that we're not um, specifically um, using like an entire performance where there may be um, the inability to segregate the portion that we want to use. Um, we would have to be careful that we would not just put more than we need out there because that would not be something that would fall under the, uh, the parameters of the, the TEACH Act. Um, so as we go through, um, we'd want to go through these different requirements. Um, and that would give us 
um, if we were able to um, stay within this rubric, that would give us the ability to have the protection of the TEACH Act. I think the important thing to remember is um, even where it is not um, very feasible for us to fall under the TEACH Act, um, we still fall under fair use. So we want to just remember that the uh, fair use doctrine is our default and that um, we can continue to use uh, things under the fair use doctrine um, even if it may be difficult to use them under the parameters of the TEACH Act. One of the th things that you notice here is the institution has provided information and materials to instruct, but also that the institution has provided notice to students that materials used in connection with the course may be subject to copyright. In the faculty guide that we linked at the beginning, you will notice that in the center, frequently asked questions, this is the copyright statement that you should be putting into your courses. It may be in the syllabus addendum, because I know we have intellectual property things pieced in there, but it is not um, a bad practice to make sure that when you put, say, a clip from a film or something that you have put in that you have determined is used within the concepts of fair use, it's nice to make the students aware of that. It brings it to their attention that they would need to consider this as well if they decided they wanted to take it out and use it in another circumstance. So this is the copyright statement that's been approved uh, for use at the college for you to post in your course. Okay. And I think it's just good to remember that um, you certainly want to use things that you will be directly incorporating into your curriculum and not uh, to have any other materials posted that may be there for further research or things that are not necessarily required or recommended reading. So we do want to be careful about what we post up on our curriculum um, because in certain cases some of those may not fall under the TEACH Act and nor would they necessarily be fair use if it's, if it's not directly uh, for the course uh, instruction. I think in terms of other things we want to make sure that we would not put up um, certainly would not want to put up any materials that are marketed for higher education. So any materials that we know um, would be um, utilized as course materials, um, course packets or textbooks or anything of that nature. And certainly we would not want to put up any copies where we may um, believe that they you know, may not have been acquired uh, legally. So those, those are the things we definitely want to make sure we don't put up there. Um, so I don't know if there's any particular questions on the TEACH Act, but I think it's good to just remember um, as you're following the provisions of the TEACH Act um, that where it is difficult to, uh, to facilitate um, using some materials under the TEACH Act because they have the, tech, the technological restrictions um, or the technology restrictions, I think um, we uh, should be mindful that we do have, um, in addition, and um, probably um, more commonly used, we do have the ability to look at it and make a determination as to fair use. So when we look at the different things that you can do, you can do your good faith analysis of fair use. You can use content that's licensed by SPC through its libraries and you have a host of uh, online databases. And when we look at that, if you're not familiar with our databases, we aren't just a print entity anymore. There are art databases where you can bring art and images into your uh, coursework. There are films that are licensed and they are already clipped. So if you didn't need to bring in a full length film to make your point, you can bring in a four to five minute clip of a particular film so that you are in more compliance uh, with copyright. You can also use Google Advanced. If some of you are not aware of what Google Advanced is, it gives you the opportunity to type all the words and things in that you want. But right at the very bottom, it says usage rights. And it says, find only the things that are free for use and sharing. Even commercially, free to modify, whatever. So you can choose the level of rights that you would like to have. And when you find that, um, those results, 
then you know that you're pretty free to use those items. If you look at learning repositories, Merlot, Orange Grove, WISC, there are many others that are out there. There are a lot of open educational resources, sometimes OER, you'll see, that are put out there with Creative Commons licenses. Creative Commons is where authors, it's kind of like the environmental movement. It's something that people embrace because they feel that intellectual property rights at times are prohibitive for continuing good education practices. And so what happens is they license their material right up front using a Creative Commons license, which extends to you, the person who comes across their material, the rights for certain uses. Sometimes it's for you to use just as it is. Sometimes it is for you to use and modify. Sometimes you need to be careful because they want you to give attribution to them and they typically provide an attribution statement for you. But a Creative Commons license is an excellent way and sometimes I just go straight out to Google and type in whatever my topic is and say Creative Commons and it typically brings up things that I can use. This is their search, their site. This little symbol down here is what you typically see when you're looking at Creative Commons licenses. And then when you click on that, it tells you that this one just requires um, attribution. You're free to copy and redistribute it. You're free to remix, transform, whatever you want to do. And so that author has already, through putting that license statement, given you permission to use this without you having to track them down or go through any analysis at all. So wherever you can, use Creative Commons and use Google Advanced to determine those things where the author has already freely given you that information. Mm -hmm. You always have the option of contacting somebody. There was a documentary recently, or actually a TV uh, documentary that came out and some instructors at Tarpon wanted to use it. Um, they weren't ready to sell the rights to an educational institution yet. So the faculty member called the producers and they said, oh yes, we'll let you use it for the purpose that you described. And so what I told her is follow up in an email where they give you that and then tuck it in a folder somewhere in your course or on your desktop so that you have record that you were given permission for that. Sometimes that's the quickest and easiest way to do something. If they tell you no, that doesn't really mean no if you do a fair use analysis and it is clearly within the scope of fair use, you could still use it. Mm -hmm. Any questions? I think it's, uh, it's uh, also uh, important to note that there is really a trend towards these open resources um, and also um, the government uh, has incorporated some of these requirements into a lot of the, uh, the large grants and uh, some of the other uh, things that are federally funded, um, such that there's going to be more and more of materials um, that are going to be open, uh, open resources, um, especially where um, they are the result of government-funded research or uh, educational uh, research that uh, may be tied to some grants. Um, so I think uh, there is more and more opportunity to find um, different uh, avenues, going through Creative Commons, looking at other open resources, going on government sites. Um, I believe there's also some good blogs, Kim. I think there's also some other good, uh, good ways to, uh, to go online and look for open resources. Um, and uh, you could also have the ability to share as well as to incorporate those. And, and Kim's right. The, the authors and creators there have the ability to set up um, how they want to manage their own rights and so they, um, they, they'll be very clear as to what you can use, what you can copy, what you may be able to, um, to utilize um, in even the creation of, of derivative documents or some other materials that would incorporate uh, their, their, uh, their copyrighted materials. Remember that you are the person using the information. So if you talk to me about copyright and it comes down to a fair use analysis, it's not 
my fair use analysis, it's your fair use analysis. Because you are the one incorporating it, you can speak more passionately and defend how you arrived at the decisions to use a particular material. So I will always refer you, if it comes down to a fair use decision, to, to using that checklist. It's often nice for you to see cases and how they have been judged. So on that page, I have a section down there, and you'll see it's Stanford Copyright and Fair Use. And what they have done is they give you a very brief description of what the challenge was and what the court considered as the important factors in arriving at a fair use, or if you look at the bottom of the category, a not fair use piece. You'll see here is the not fair use re relative to Gerald Ford's unpublished memoirs, which he had given rights to. You'll see, if you go down further, here are cases relative to artwork, visual arts, and audiovisual cases that you might look at. Usually, higher education use is favorable. But what you need to consider is just because you're in higher education, every use of a material is not necessarily educational. We have had requests to take down when people have created um, decorative elements to their web pages or their course pages. So you, now that we have a stronger marketing department, maybe we don't have some of that, but it's something to keep in mind. It's not for entertainment. It's really for that transformative use. You are taking something out of the public realm and transforming it into something that becomes very educational and essential to conveying an element in your course. So now that I've talked forever, <laughs> if you haven't gone to sleep, uh, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to help. And you know where to find us in the directory if you need anything else. Yes. Please feel free to post any questions or to pose them or send them to uh, Kim or I. OK, thank you so much. Um, I've included all the links. I think I got all of them that uh, Kim and Suzanne shared uh, via the chat window. And if you want any of these links, just send me an email. I'll make sure to send them to you as well. Um, I've also included a link, uh, Kim, and uh, y'all mentioned um, the Creative Commons licensing for images and videos and such. And we yes. actually have a course that we outline a lot of those resources on my courses. So I've included a link to the instructional, the smorgasbord of technology. Great. The link that provides uh, faculty access to all kinds of tools and searches and images and videos and things that already exist. We tried to make sure to include a lot of videos that were already captioned, things here at the college as well as things outside of the college that you can use in your class um, that are covered by Creative Commons. So. There's a description of that course as well as a link to register. If you have any questions about that, just email my courses for faculty and we will make sure to respond to you as quick as possible. Um, so thank you again. Thank everybody for attending during this beautiful summer day. It's very hot outside, so it's nice to be here. Um, and if you have any questions, please uh, give us a call. Thank you very much. Thank you.